A very warm welcome and good morning to all of you. My name is Guntram Wolf and I'm the director of the German Council on Foreign Relations and um, I want to welcome you to today's uh, morning briefing. Today we want to be discuss Russian and Chinese military cooperation and what it means for international security, a very hot topic with many dimensions. Um, and we are really pleased uh, to have three excellent uh, speakers um, that are really experts on the matter uh, with us this morning. Uh, we will start with uh, my colleague, um, Betty Su. She's a research fellow in our Center for Security and Defense at the German Council. Um, then we go to Alexander Gawev, a senior fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. And last but not least, Sarah Kirchberger um, from the Center for Asia-Specific uh, Strategy and Security, a very well-known expert on maritime um, security um, at, the Kiel, at the Kiel University. And so, so it's really great to have all of you here uh, with us. And thank you so much for uh, joining us today. As you know, we spent the first 30 minutes um, discussing mostly among ourselves, and then we open up to questions. Um, the uh, event is recorded, and afterwards uh, it will be put on YouTube and other social media channels. Um, if you want to ask a question, please raise your hand or put your, your virtual hand or put your question in the chat um, and we will try to be as responsive as, as possible in the second half of the hour. Without much further ado, um, Betty, I want to turn to you to give us just an overview of um, the increased military cooperation in, in Southeast Asia, in particular between Russia and, and China. Um, the intrusions into airspace, the joint maneuvering, um, and perhaps your first view on what it all means for international security. Patty. Thank you, Gunther. I'm very happy to do that. Hello, everyone. Um, if I may first mention that we have a project at the DJIP, a project called um, Arms Control and Risk Reduction in the Asia-Pacific Region, a project that aims to raise awareness um, and knowledge, frankly, about military security issues in the Asia-Pacific Region within the German-European discourse. Um, and to clarify, Asia-Pacific, uh, hereby I refer to a focus on China, Russia, North Korea, South Korea, Japan, Taiwan, Australia, and the US. Um, and I will share a link um, in a little bit to the project website that includes some publications on security developments and defense planning, for example, by Japan and Australia. Since there are some very significant shifts and changes in their um, defense planning in light of clear threats. And speaking of threats, um, I will now focus, given also today's topic, on some of those clear threats that we face in the Asia Pacific region. I'm sharing my slides just to give you also a geographic overview a little bit. Um, so as you can maybe tell from this map, the Asia Pacific region is a region with multiple sources for risks of conflict. For example, given the density of military activities in the region, as well as deployments in the region, including also significant troop presence and strategic assets by the US in the region. Um, and there are also at least three long standing hotspots of conflict um, in order of geog geography. On the Korean Peninsula, for example, um, given North Korea's nuclear weapons buildup um, and also significant missile developments, for example, last year, risks of conflict concerning Taiwan, given relevant Chinese arms developments, and also military exercises such as those in August last year and also risks of conflict in the South China Sea, continuing militarization of islands by China, as well as clashes such as the very recent clashes between um, China and the Philippines in the South China Sea. Now, I would like to zoom into 
the one second into a very particular um, source of new threats in the region, um, which are combined military activities by China and Russia in the region. The white arrows you see now on the map show which waterways Chinese and Russian forces passed through in joint sea patrols um, over the course of last year. And China and Russia conducted three such sea patrols in the Western Pacific just last year. And they had strategic air and maritime assets, particip assets participate in these um, patrols, such as guided missile destroyers and strategic bombers. They also conducted live fire drills in the north of the East Sea or the Sea of Japan and aircrafts, participating aircrafts landed at each other's airfields. This is in itself, I believe, important or hmm, important in a negative way for, for regional security. Um, but I believe it also shows, or these kind of sea patrols are also part of a larger pattern um, in Chinese Russian military cooperation. At least that's my observation and I'm happy to, to hear Sarah and Alexander on this as well. Because if you see this table, um, and I'm not going to go into detail of all of this, but just to highlight that we have now had two decades of combined military exercises by Chinese and Russian forces. And while some longstanding forms of joint military drills might remain, there seems to be a shift towards joint sea patrols and naval exercises and in strategically important waters, be it, for example, in the, in the Western Pacific, as just shown, as well as in parts of the Indian Ocean. In 2019 and last year, China and Russia conducted combined naval exercises with Iran in the Sea of Oman, very close to the Strait of Hormuz. And China and Russia also conducted combined naval exercises with South Africa along the later coast in 2019 and will convene um, again such naval drills for the next two weeks starting tomorrow. And with this, Guntram, um, I'm happy to hand over back to you. Thank you so much, Betty, for kicking us off with, uh, off with these clear um, charts and um, clear numbers. Um, quite some activity going on between uh, between the two countries. Let's now turn to to Alex Alexander, please. Thanks, and I'm happy to be with you. Uh, very quick points here. Um, I think that as important as the maritime drills and joint air patrols are. This is the smaller and not as consequential part of the story about China-Russia military cooperation. Uh, it's important because we see that there is a certain pattern. Uh, the number of drills is increasing, the number of assets is increasing. And then last year was pretty telling that whenever China says that uh, it tries to distance itself from Russia, all of the planned exercises went as normal. And then if the number of uh, patrols of strategic bombers was the pattern was once a year since 2019, last year there were two patrols and probably we're gonna see two patrols this year and maybe even more. But that's a less significant part. The most significant part is threefold. Number one, since uh, the China-Russia alignment is growing deeper and increasingly asymmetric with China having more leverage and more control in the relationship, we see that the flow of strategic assets and military technologies from Russia to China is also increasing. Russia has sold throughout the 90s and the first two decades of this century uh, a lot of sensitive technology to China. And it looks like it continues to do so with the types of systems that the Russians sell and type of designs that the Russians sell undisclosed, particularly since CATS uh, uh, sanctions introduced by the US Congress in 2018 covered the armament department of the PLA. It's uh, had General Li Shangfu 
a lot of this uh, type of interactions have gone to become the underwater part of the iceberg. We don't have that much visibility about it. Uh, Putin drops uh, sometimes some lines about what's going on. For example, Russia is helping China to build the early warning system for an incoming missile attack. Or in 2022, he said that Russia and China are actually jointly developing some weapons. Uh, so I think that this is the most significant part. PLA now has direct access to Russian R&D. And I know that some people are skeptical about the quality of Russian weapons given Russia's poor performance in Ukraine. But make no mistake, it's really not about the toolkit, uh, but it's much more about the Russia's ability to use the toolkit it has, particularly in integrated fashion. There is still a lot of stuff that's of interest to China when we are talking to maritime domain, it's uh, subs and particularly submarines that are capable of carrying nuclear weapons. That's one. Second part uh, concerns nuclear deterrent. Uh, for a very long time, uh, global nuclear architecture was uh, guided by the arms control regimes established by the Soviet Union and the US. Now, one after another, these pillars are being destroyed. And the last remaining major agreement, the Star Treaty, is also in limbo since the Russians are not allowing American inspections. Um, with this, it's very likely that after 2025, we won't have a Star Treaty and it will be uh, grab for all. Uh, China, as you know, is rapidly expanding its stockpile of nuclear arms. It's modernizing uh, all of the elements of the nuclear triad, including the submarines. And uh, the concern in the Pentagon and increasingly in other parts of the U.S. government is like, if you remember the movie, uh, The Good, the Bad and the Ugly, where at the end the guys stand deterring each other by pointing cults at each other. Uh, now, uh, it's not the previous uh, picture where there were three guys pointing guns at each other, but these are two guys, although they don't have a type of Article 5 security guarantees, but they are increasingly one team. And the U.S. needs to match this combined nuclear potential. Uh, and there is a creative discussion in the Pentagon on how do you do that? Because matching one warhead by one warhead is really expensive, but uh, it's yet another part of the arms race. And then since uh, the Pentagon budget is not unlimited, uh, it brings a very tough discussions on prioritization. How much money should go into upgrading and modernizing the nuclear armed force and also accounting for growing China-Russia alignment and how much money should go to other platforms and the needs that uh, the allies and the US specifically might have in the maritime domain. Third part is that uh, since Russia and China are much more aligned and this ugly war in Ukraine is likely to continue for quite some time, there will always be a preoccupation in the European theater that will require the US forces, the attention of the US military planners and the senior leadership to kind of focus on the European theater. Uh, yes, Europeans want to take more responsibility, but as you know, nothing in hard security in Europe happens without NATO and without the US. With that, that just gives China much more room to play uh, in, the, in the Pacific as the US is somewhat distracted uh, and uh, Russians turning off and on the heat uh, in its provocative behavior, not necessarily uh, the Ukraine war, but the air flights and breaches of airspace of NATO countries will always keep the US more busy there and then allowing China to do more stuff in the Indo-Pacific. I'll stop here. Wonderful. Thanks so much, uh, Alexander, for this quite, I would say, um, gloomy, but probably quite realistic picture. Um, deeper relations between China, China and the US, uh, including uh, cooperation on technology, 
first big point um second nuclear deterrence greater co collaboration and well the fact that Ukraine is um, going to keep Europe busy and NATO busy because it's hard security. So thanks so much for these great, great three points. Uh, Sarah, let's go to you. Hi, good morning. Uh, very happy to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Yes, I can only underline actually all the points made by uh, the previous two speakers. So I'm fully on board with their assessments. And what I want to do is I want to just... Um, put that also a little bit into the perspective of how it historically developed, because it's right, as Elizabeth said, that uh, the naval cooperation was basically the strongest element in the beginning, but we have been seeing since 2012, I would argue, so first beginnings, maybe 2008, but then 2012, and then enhanced since 2014, a massive deepening of this military cooperation. And what underpins this is what Alexander also mentioned, uh, a massive military industrial co cooperation element. So that is always what uh, also is a good indicator of trust between countries because the quality of the weapon systems that you share basically are limited by the extent to which you can trust your partner. And we know that there have been trust issues in the past, uh, for instance, in 2008, 2009, where uh, China reverse engineered a lot of the weapon systems that it got from Russia. So it was about planes, it was about also individual systems such as radar systems. And the Russian military industries were not happy cooperating with the Chinese be because of these bad experiences. But something has shifted. It seems to have been also an agreement on the highest levels of the polity between Xi Jinping and Putin, basically, who seem to have uh, come to an understanding of, of uh, doing things differently. And I think we can really see that uh, at least from 2019 onwards, there was a combined thrust really to challenge this US-led Western order in, on many levels. And just to add one point to the uh, mentions of the uh, joint sea patrols in, in Asia that uh, Elizabeth outlined, there was also a strategic bomber patrol in, in the summer of 2019. And I think it's important also to look at how these patrols are done. And this bomber patrol was the first like strategic bomber uh, air, you know, exercise together, but they did it very skillfully in a area between Korea and Japan that is actually contested, you could say, where, where Korea holds the island of Dokdo that Japan also claims. And what happened was that actually the air forces of both South Korea and Japan started to send interceptor planes to scare the, the bombers away. And even the South Korean Air Force actually uh, fired warning shots at the Russian bombers, which is quite extreme in such a case. But uh, South Korea was very angry that, that Japan also interfered in this. And uh, this led actually to a breakdown almost in the military relationship between South Korea and Japan. They stopped, South Korea stopped an intelligence sharing or did not prolong an intelligence sharing agreement. And the United States had another problem on its hands because these two close allies in, in Asia are essential pillars of the American alliance systems there. So if they do not talk to each other or refuse to cooperate, that's the problem, right? So that was really skillfully done by Russia and China to drive wedges between these alliances. And we can see it also in the Ukraine war, how um, Russia is trying to drive wedges between the Western partners, and I would argue helped by China. I would uh, like to make also a couple of remarks on um, how should we interpret China's lack of enthusiastic support in military terms for, for Russia's war against Ukraine? Because what I often encounter is a notion by people that, well, China is not fighting for Russia, and this means there's not a lot of support there in actuality. And I would strongly warn against interpreting that in such a way, because what this perspective completely neglects is the history of arms transfers and military strategic support in the sense of technical support from Ukraine to China. 
So China has a long story of, of deep indebtedness to Ukraine for building its own military. And just to give you a couple of examples, Ukraine during the time when Russia was still reluctant to, to uh, give its most, most advanced weapon systems to China, Ukraine supplied some of the most important in a qualitative sense weapon systems, such as the hull of an aircraft carrier. And then it helped China finish, build that hull into a functioning carrier. Also, Ukraine provided uh, China access to this aircraft carrier training center on Crimea, Nitka, helped China basically set up an infrastructure for training the pilots to take off from aircraft carriers. The Chinese training center was built, modeled after this facility in Ukraine. Also, lots of advisors from Ukraine were involved in that process. Also, Ukraine uh, provides all the naval gas turbines that power large Chinese warships. So they literally would not be able to power their destroyer fleet or anything larger than that without these Ukrainian gas turbines. So warship without propulsion is obviously completely useless. So just to give you a couple of examples, there's many more like interesting radar systems too. So based on that, it's also interesting to note that there's a friendship treaty between China and Ukraine signed by Xi Jinping himself on the 5th of December of 2013. And if you read that treaty, which is hard be because it's not online in English, um, it's actually, it reads as if China would actually have an obligation to defend Ukraine right now against the threat that it faces, which China is obviously not doing, right? So just, just mentioning this to, to put into perspective the notion that China is somehow fully and not really supporting Russia, I would argue by, by uh, claiming that NATO is to blame for this war, by, by not, uh, not you know, uh, criticizing Russia and by supplying all these products for the armed forces right below the threshold of actual arms, China is actually doing the, the maximum that it can do without damaging, um, seriously damaging its reputation as a partner to other countries, um, for instance, in Africa and so on. Yeah, maybe just to, to sum this up uh, with a brief mention, we actually did a book project on the question of Russia-China military cooperation that was out in, in uh, last year in June. It's called Russia-China uh, relations, emerging alliance, or eternal rivals. And we had a couple of, of great experts, actually 20 experts from 10 different countries, look into some of these interesting issues. And just, uh, just to give you one example, totally overlooked in most cases, an Estonian researcher who worked with us, Frank Juris, uncovered uh, through OSINT analysis of Russian and Chinese websites, so he's a speaker of both these languages, that there's an ongoing collaboration between, in the Russian Arctic actually, between experts from China and Russia to develop hydroacoustics equipment and underwater robotics for Arctic waters. So that is equipment for anti-submarine warfare, obviously. And this again bolsters the point that Alexander made that there is a danger now that Russia is becoming almost fully dependent on Chinese support due to its isolation that there's actually a danger that more sensitive submarine knowledge, submarine equipment, maybe including even technology for the strategic submarines could wander from Russia to China when uh, Russia becomes less and less inclined to be careful about this strategic relationship. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Sarah, for these also very clear um, uh, intervention, this very clear intervention. Um, perhaps the one point I want to push both of you on is, uh, is a point, um, I think, uh, Alex, you, you raised it, um, that we shouldn't draw the wrong lesson from, uh, from, you, from the war in Ukraine, that um, the Ukrainian, that the Russian military equipment isn't up to standards. Um, but it's rather the deployment um, um, that that is uh, is to be blamed for um, the uh, the heavy losses in material that that Russia is 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 incurring. So, Sarah, do you share the assessment that actually Russia 
has uh, top edge um, military capabilities and military know-how and it's just more on the deployment side the issue or um, how, how do you see re how do you assess really um, sort of the results um, uh, on the battlefield um, in Ukraine uh, in terms of the military strengths of um, uh, of the I mean of the equipment basically um, yeah, what, what you see in Ukraine, uh, the Russian performance has really surprised a lot of observers because uh, what it shows is the, the massive effect of corruption, for instance, in the armed forces and the mil military industrial system. So a lot of the systems are actually not performing as intended because they have not been maintained, they are not in bad state and so on. Also, the motivation of the armed forces is heavily impacted, has been from, from the beginning. Now, of course, you have conscripts and, and recruits from prisons uh, fighting uh, without a lot of actual experience doing that. But in the beginning, even you could see a lack of motivation and a lot of these you know, um, issues of doctrine and so on. So the military equipment as such is, of course, not on par with the top-notch Western equipment. Uh, on the other hand, I used to work in the arms industry before, so in, in, in t I worked at, at a naval shipyard. And when we looked at Russian ships at the time, our assessment was always that it may not be um, state of the art in every sense, but it's it's a lot of guns uh, for 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 not a lot of money. So co coming from the perspective of a customer, these ships may not be so survivable. They may not be uh, offer a lot of comfort for the troops. They may not not be very luxurious. But if you had have, have a lot of them and they are cheap, they can still do a hell of a lot of damage if you're prepared to lose a couple of them, like we saw, for instance, also with the Moskva. And we can see the heavy damage that the Kaliber missiles are doing, fired from the submarines in the Black Sea. There's literally no um, defense, you know, um, against these submarines. If they are dive, you cannot find them. And it's, um, it's, it's, it's a mixed bag, basically. So some systems, some Russian systems are probably really outdated. And China has begun to produce its own systems based on the Russian and Ukrainian, you know, models that it got a long time ago. So the Russian military is not exactly the same in the sense of the performance of the systems as the Chinese. They have some, some pockets of excellence, as we saw with hypersonics, for instance, where they are probably far ahead of a lot of other competitors already. But it's still, as Alex also said, um, a lot of you know procedural knowledge and and the experience of individual engineers that that makes up for a lot of things. Mm -hmm. You can have uh, all the blueprints in the world to copy if you obtain them, for instance, from espionage. But if you don't have engineers who know how to put this into reality, it's not much use. So I say it's a mixed bag. It's hard to answer. Thanks so much. Um, Alex, do you want to react to that point or any other point that Sarah made, please? No, I absolutely agree. It's really not necessarily state of the art. My point is that uh, the performance is much worse because of the maintenance of equipment and inability to use it in an organized fashion. But it's really uh, more about quantities. Uh, yes, some um, quality systems like HIMARS make a difference but uh, it's really much more, since uh, they cannot be supplied to Ukraine in quantities needed to overrun the Russian military machine, quantity also matters. And then uh, the Russians still have some know-hows uh, and some technologies that China doesn't have and that China needs to prop up the PLA military machine. And Russians were holding back a lot of this uh, and now they don't have restraint because war is organizing principle of Russian security uh, policy. Uh, there are no constraints. If China is providing the economic lifeline to sustain the war effort, it's the major buyer of Russian oil and other commodities. If it's supplying the technology mm -hmm. below the threshold of sanctions, uh, and if it's the major competitor to the US, so strengthening China helps Russia to stick it back to the US, then Putin is sure. totally okay to green light this. Sure. 
So that uh, that that point on the uh, on the um, economic base of of Russia. I mean, we just published um, a, a piece yesterday on on Russia's war economy, um, where of course the economic base um, has done actually quite well last year. I mean, it has been. Uh, better than forecasted, and the sanctions have had less effect uh, in terms of the economic uh, activities. We are seeing, however, that as of this year, uh, revenues for oil are actually coming down quite substantially for, for Russia, um, thanks to the oil price cap and the sanctions um, imposed. Um, so there is some hope there on the economic base, but it's true, of course, that oil exported, exports have been redirected to China even though they come at a at a discount, I mean, just to be to be very clear um, clear there, um, but technology sanctions have been hindering Russian activities and Russian military production. Um, even though increasingly last year there have been ways uh, around it, right? I mean, the, uh, so so more um, uh, gray uh, gray uh, intermediary firms in uh, in Central Asia. Um, that have been uh, able to um, replace uh, the lack of ships um, and ship them basically through third countries. So, so there's, I think there's a lot of adaptation ongoing in, in Russia to the sanction regime. Um, and, and China, of course, plays an important role because it basically um, uh, protects, uh, protects um, Russia from some of the most uh, severe and direct interventions. So, so this is fascinating. Um, Betty, uh, do you want to want to come in and and add um, add a comment, and then I I want to uh, open up to questions. I have nothing to add to the Ukraine question or the sanctions, <clears throat> etc. But um, yeah, maybe for now, let I'm happy to move on to the questions. There are quite some good ones raised in the chat already. Can I pick That's, up one, Guntram, or do please, you want to? Please, why don't you pick up one? Yeah, please. Sure, because <laughs> I saw one um, mentioned by Nicolas von Schöpf, which is referring to the upcoming um, visit by Xi Jinping to Moscow, to Putin. Um, and I, I'd be curious to also hear Alexander and Sarah on this. Um, one thing I would add here, I don't know if the, if the summit would be the right um, venue for that or the right occasion for that, but I'm kind of waiting for the new five-year agreement on space cooperation. Um, China and Russia have been cooperating, I think it was 2017 that they signed the last five-year agreement, so there should be another one this year. Um, and yeah, the, the cooperation in in terms of orbital space and capability development here is I think also very, very significant. So yeah, that is something probably on the horizon, but handing over to my fellow panelists or to Guntram. Well, I mean, let's let's perhaps bring bring together a few questions. And again, um, please, if you if you want to ask a direct question, um, uh, raise your hand. Um, not just uh, post questions in the chat, but but raise your hand, and then we can bring you in, into the conversation. And I see that a person named Peter has raised um, his hand. Uh, Peter, if you want to come in and just ask your question directly, I would like uh, to ask a question to Mr. Gabuyev. Uh, concerning the uh, collective security treaty organization, what do you think? Uh, well, in your opinion, to what extent, uh, to what extent can we uh, talk about the changing uh, attitude of China towards uh, the CSTO? Is there anything new, especially in the light of uh, uh, things going on in Ukraine? Okay, um, thank you. I, uh, Alex, let's let's collect two or three if you if you don't mind. If you can just write it down, because there is another one uh, which I think um, is already creating some debate here, uh, which is basically that it's a fallacy here that uh, uh, fallacy democracies versus autocracies. Um, China has no intention. I presume this is this is written by a Chinese um, author. China has no intention to threaten and change Europe. On the contrary, we only see U.S. aircraft carriers, British, French, German warships show up near Chinese borders. Did you see Chinese warships coming to Europe to show mass um, 
We also see NATO step up its relations with Japan and South Korea. My question is, how do you see China strengthen ties with Russia as a response to step up and tighten US Western containment and choking? Uh, the West has successfully produced one devastating war in Europe. Should the world continue to let it produce another one in, in the Pacific? So I think that's a, that's a good and controversial question to, uh, I, that I think will, will trigger some responses from you. Um, and um, um, then there is a, perhaps a third question which we can pose to all of our speakers by, by Torben Schütz. Um, it is likely that China will capture parts of the global arms market currently tied to um, uh, Russia, given that Russia's defense industry will focus on domestic orders and might, might lose standing uh, with international customers. Um, perhaps we can take those three questions um, and uh, let me get to Sarah first. <clears throat> All right, yeah, the second question sounds exactly like something the Chinese military attache asked uh, recently at a different uh, venue I attended, so it's probably coming from the Chinese embassy. Anyway, have you seen Chinese warships in Europe? Yes, we've seen them many times, for instance, in the Mediterranean Sea, where they have exercised with the Russian Navy. Actually, there was at one point, I was told this by, by naval officers from the West, more Russian and Chinese warships in the Mediterranean Sea than uh, NATO warships. And we've also seen them in the Baltic Sea. Now, I've actually visited a Chinese warship, both in Hamburg, where I live, and in Kiel, where I work. So I was on board the frigate Binjou in, I think it was 1908, uh, 2018 in June, when it exercised with the Russian Navy in the Baltic Sea. Uh, before it did that, it came to Kiel to attend Kiel Week, and I was actually at the reception, and also in Hamburg, there was a small flotilla coming in there, a Type 71 landing ship uh, together with a frigate. So yes, to make it short, Chinese warships have often been in Europe. They have also transited the channel, the British Channel, for instance. And interestingly, uh, when uh, when asked why the Chinese object to uh, respecting the law of the sea, which clearly states that short of entering into the territorial sea, warships are free to exercise and pass anywhere, also including inside the economic zone of a country, um, and why China objects to that in the South China Sea, but at the same time demands the right to pass through other countries' economic zones in Europe or in the Arctic, then the answer is sometimes something like this. Uh, when we come to you, we follow your rules. And when you come to us, you follow ours. So pointing to, um, to an idea that not the same rules apply to everyone. So that's my response to the question, have you seen Chinese warships in Europe? And the other part of that question is also interesting. The West has successfully produced one devastating war in Europe. I assume it means uh, that this refers to the Ukraine war. If that is the case, it shows an appalling tendency to absolutely deny any culpability on the part of Russia, which is actually the country that invaded Ukraine, a strategic partner of China that China is not assisting and not helping. And as we know, they're not even picking up the phone when President Zelensky tries to call the Chinese leader. So in that sense, why is China behaving in such a way? The only uh, interpretation is it's somehow supportive of this war of annihilation that Russia conducts inside Ukraine, blaming the West as a, as a pretty poor excuse for not standing up for its strategic partner, Ukraine. So that's my answer to this question. And uh, the third one was about, um, was about the arms trade and that China could win maybe uh, shares from Russia in the African that's countries, right? right? That's right. Yeah, that's true. It's It can happen. It's already uh, happening, I would say. For instance, with lower end warships that are smaller and, and not as expensive as some Western models, China <laughs> has already gained a foothold in quite a few African countries, for instance, Nigeria, but also Algeria, and exports uh, more and more weapons in countries that are traditionally uh, markets for Russian weapons. And I think that trend will probably accelerate. 
Wonderful, thank you, Alex. Uh, you uh, please, please feel free to react to uh, to any of those three points. Also, the the visit of China's president um, in uh, in Moscow um, that is that is upcoming. Uh, but also, let's go to the bottom of the questions. Um, uh, there is the question by um, oh my God, this is moving so fast. Uh, David Fouquet, uh, Russian capability is indeed a mixed bag. The only Russian carrier, uh, Kuznetsov, has been a virtually junk pile for several years. But to add to this one-sided view, Russia was able to redeploy tens of thousands of forces from the Eastern Front with China to the Western Front. On the other side, the Western Indo-Pacific cooperation and ad hoc alliance building is growing almost weekly. State Councillor Wang Yi is also uh, on a Western Europe tour. Any comment to, to that, um, I think would also be really interesting, please. All right, uh, first on CSTO, I think that China was never overly concerned about CSTO. Uh, it sees uh, CSTO as basically as ex an extension of some Russian security guarantees to Central Asian countries. And uh, when we think about the events in Kazakhstan January last year, China was actually happy for Russia to intervene to help the uh, President Takayev uh, to kind of clamp down on some forces supported by a family of former President Nazarbayev, because China just simply doesn't have this uh, vast amount of Kazakh or Russian speaking paratroopers that could work together with the uh, Kazakh security services. So Russia playing as a local police force in Central Asia is something beneficial to China, but it also sees that the credibility of Russia is going down because a lot of Russian neighbors, particularly in Kazakhstan, which shares a lengthy border, which has some Russian population in the northern parts, uh, of the country is increasingly concerned about Moscow's unpredictability and like all of this imperial rhetorics about recreating the Russian world and stuff is really concerning. At the same time, both the countries and China are quite aware of residual power that Russia has in this region. When everybody says that CSTO is dead and every Russian center format in the former Soviet space is dead, I think that's premature. If Russia wants to create a lot of problems for countries like Kazakhstan or Kyrgyzstan, it can do so. And I think everybody is very much aware uh, about it. So there is a division of labor because China's skepticism in the region is also strong, particularly Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan. And that's connected to uh, imprisonment of ethnic Kazakhs and Kyrgyz uh, in Xinjiang. <laughs> Uh, so I think that there is a mix back and uh, China also watches what's happening in South Caucasus where Russia is not uh, following through on its security obligations towards Armenia and understands that you have more leverage and you can push Russia around a little bit. Uh, I totally agree on the arms market. Uh, I think that a lot of Russian legacy weapons from the African continent has been cleared through help of friends of Ukraine who helped to bring these weapons to Ukrainian defenders. Uh, a lot of this equipment was uh, very poorly maintained. So a lot of tanks uh, standing uh, in uh, Algeria and other parts were not operational. So the market now is clear whether Russia has the capacity to produce stuff for these countries uh, is not very clear to me. I doubt this. But I think Russia will be able to produce some equipment for the countries uh, where this equipment, like cutting edge technologies that Russia has, can be swapped for something. And Iran is a very good example. Russia cannot pr uh, produce the Shahid drones at scale. It needs them to terrorize Ukrainian civilian infrastructure. And part of the bargain is, produce, uh, is providing... Um, could you, could, could you mute? Please mute, yeah. Sure. Um, so it's swapping the Russian fighter jets for the Shahid drones. And the interesting spot here would be really India. Uh, and I think that uh, India has very high dependency on the Russian toolkit. 
but it also now understands that the idea to drive a wedge between Russia and China and to balance Russian's foreign policy by providing its options, it's probably futile. So Russia will be increasingly dependent on China. The risk for uh, Indian armed forces will be 10 years down the road, Chinese will ask Russia to do something to the equipment that it has sold to India and Russia will do so, like not providing maintenance or whatever. So the risks are there and switching to Western platforms, particularly American, Japanese and French is a necessity for India. So I think that there is a trend line um, here to, to watch. Finally, on Wang Yi's visit, uh, I think that it's very predictable. Wang Yi does this tour in Europe. He goes to the Munich Security Conference, and then he goes to Moscow, and uh, it will be portrayed by China as, oh, we've listened to all of your great suggestions, and we are now playing this uh, shuttle diplomacy, and we are trying to uh, talk the Russians out of using weapons of mass destruction or creating this very dangerous situation and try to kind of behave in a more humane way where uh, in reality it's all about pragmatic Chinese self-interest. We don't know whether the visit of uh, Chinese President Xi Jinping uh, will happen. Uh, it has been announced by the Russian side, not confirmed by the Chinese side and just I think it will be subject to what will happen uh, on the battlefield. If we see another Mariupol or another Ukrainian city being annihilated by the Russians throughout uh, the spring, uh, probably it's not the best optic to kind of have a Xi Jinping Putin handshake uh, in the Kremlin. But Russia is just very slowly drifting into China's arms. China has leverage. It doesn't need to be a visit of Chinese president for this to happen. So I think that China has multiple options where Russia has increasingly few amount of options. Great, wonderful. Um, um, Alex, there, there is a question directly to you. So let me uh, kick that question to you also, uh, which is about Putin's upcoming State of the Nation address um, to the Federal Assembly on February 21. What are we to be expecting from that? Something, something essential, something important, something new? What do you think? Um, I don't think so. Uh, first, I don't know. And uh, it's just really daunting how much the Kremlin manages to control the flow of information. A uh, couple of years back, you would know the major talking points, and there would be a lot of reporting. Now it's non-existent. Uh, I would expect that a lot will be talking about the social guarantees for the uh, families of fallen heroes and just trying to make the point that the state takes all of its financial obligations seriously and then sending your loved ones to die in Ukraine is uh, not too bad because A, you are defending the motherland, uh, but B, uh, if your husband's uh, son, uh, brother will be killed there, you will be paid by the state. Uh, and I think that it, there will be a lot of this content. And then just justification of war, saying that Russia didn't have another option. And that since the fight was inevitable, Russia preferred to strike first. Uh, I don't think that we will see any major announcement like yet another uh, wave of mobilization or something like that. So, so let me ask a few more questions um, that that are here in the chat. So, so one question is about a warning um, that Henry Kissinger gave apparently in an article quite early on in 2014 of the danger of uh, after after Putin's famous MSC speech um, in 2007 um, of the warning that uh, he, he made that warning that. Increasingly, um, Russia would be driven into the arms of, of China. Um, and um, a, another question that is quite related to that one is by Klaus Wittmann is that, um, well, uh, I agree that Russia can still create a lot of trouble. Should not China be increasingly concerned about Russia being nothing but a spoiler nation with only obstructive uh, policies? So, so perhaps we can try to understand a bit more the China-Russia relation. I mean, I understand as Russia gets weaker, 
uh, it's more it become and more isolated globally it becomes more reliant on China as a partner but at what stage will China feel that um, it needs to much more strongly support um, Russia uh, to keep um, to keep the balance alive to keep the state also relatively strong I mean how do you see that relationship evolve um, also in light of um, the two comments that were just just made um, just more a political question than a military one but Sarah please yeah thank you well uh, to the question regarding Kissinger I mean he has recently self-corrected his own assessment by by now recommending that Ukraine should join NATO uh, the fear of NATO enlargement has often been cited as apparently by some people believe that this prompted the Russian aggression, but now you see Finland uh, decides to join NATO, more than doubling the actual uh, borderline uh, of Russia with NATO, and Putin's comment was, we are, that doesn't bother us really, um, and, uh, and it's anyway, the Russia-China um, alignment started to really take off after the Russian aggression mm -hmm. against Crimea. So in 2014, that was really, in my view, the watershed moment. So. I would say it is a little bit uh, telling history wrong to say that this is a Western uh, aggression or threat or whatever that drove the two together. It's more um, the, the shared concern that both countries have of trying to control their own periphery, trying to impose on neighboring countries um, uh, some sort of control like a sphere of influence or whatever and this is, is a commonality that these two governments share and that makes them if you will like-minded countries <laughs> I would say so as far as Xi Jinping and Putin are both in power I see this trend continuing and I don't think it has a lot of, to do with what western countries <clears throat> throw at them that's just how I see it and to the other uh, remark by Klaus Wittmann um, I think one has really to look also into the domestic Chinese uh, situation to understand what Russia now means to China. I know that there's a lot of criticism inside China with this choice that Xi Jinping personally made of aligning so closely with Russia. So in light of the Russian problems in the war in Ukraine, a lot of people seem to now question the wisdom of this policy in terms of Russia now just looking bad. So if you have this strategic partner before the war that seemed like Putin is this strategic genius that knows how to really challenge the Western order that is so super smart and playing his hand really well. And then suddenly all, it, all of it you know, implodes. And basically you see that there was a huge strategic, uh, you could say misassessment of the situation, a lot of damage done. <clears throat> so China is really now concerned with damage control and with not looking bad by association with a losing cause. And I, I do think that China now has a big interest in making sure that Russia is not completely humiliated in, at the end of this war and that Russia is, is walking away with something that can be sold at least in public as some sort of um, success or some sort of gain. That's how I interpret the, the Chinese comments that we should not talk about a Ukrainian victory in this war because that's not cannot be the goal of China, but mainly for, for saving face in terms of um, you know having sided with them before. So that's how I see the situation. Mm. It is as Alex also I think correctly said, it's an evolving situation. It depends on the further course of the war and on the final outcome of the war, how uh, China will position itself towards Russia, but it's, it's certainly very happy to take advantage of the Russian weakness in terms of importing hydrocarbons at a bargain sure. and, and getting extra grain and so on. Well, let, let's bring in Bet, Betty um, on the China-Russia relation and perhaps with a more specific focus on the um, on the Pacific, um, in the Pacific. Um, how do you see that relation evolve as, as we go further and how is it affected by, by the current situation? Sure, thank you, Gunfram. I'd just like to, to stress that we're still, of course, we're talking about more coordination, more cooperation in the military sphere, but not of an alliance per se. So there's still some flexibility um, 
less fears of entrapment maybe um, than with other arrangements. Um, because there is, I mean, and that's why I probably focused so much in, in my presentation on the on the sea patrols, this wish to at least posture as if there's a united front, there is combined um, power, so to speak, a projection of power vis-a-vis -vis the, the allies in Asia Pacific, like um, Japan, Australia, US, also South Korea, but to, to a little bit different extent that also project a united front. So this, um, tit for tat, so to speak, of presenting at least united fronts. Um, and of course, in, in terms of global diplomacy, be it, for example, on, on, on North Korea, there is also a, a joint voice that China and Russia um, speak. But yeah, I'd love to, to also hear Sarah and Alexander um, jump on this maybe as well. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I, okay, wonderful. Thanks. So let me give to, to Alex, but add a question. And then I think we are also coming to an end, really. Um, uh, so I cannot take many more questions. So, so I take the last two. One is by James Willey about um, the value and durability of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Uh, perhaps you can say a few words about that. And then by Boris Ginsburg. Um, uh, how is China dealing with the fact that since 2014, Russia has been supporting separatist movements, um, something which China is very afraid of regarding its territory, see Xinjiang, Hong Kong, and Tibet. Um, so, so perhaps you can comment on, on those. Well, um, well, there is a third one, sorry, which I still want to ask, which is um, if there is time. Uh, somehow, we haven't much discussed the obvious question, Taiwan and China's lessons learned from Russia, um, uh, um, on, uh, from Russia's attack on Ukraine. I mean, so, so perhaps we can take those three questions. And, uh, and Alex, if you can be brief, then we have a chance that Sarah also says something and then we stop sharp at, the, at half the hour. Alex, please. Sure. Sure. Uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization is a club. Uh, it's not uh, something similar to NATO. Uh, I think that China lost hopes to turn it into an efficient regional organization after Russia pushed for India to join and then China traded this for uh, Pakistan membership, having India and Pakistan in one uh, organization where there is a consensus decision making is making this into a club. But it's a useful club. It has a Shanghai in its name, and then the Secretary General sits in Beijing. I don't think that China entertains bigger ambitions, but it's a kind of nice platform to meet the local leaders. On support for separatism, China is not that happy about it, but uh, it believes that its agency to change this uh, is close to zero. Uh, and this is also why China all the time uh, says that it supports Ukrainian territorial integrity, sovereignty, it doesn't recognize Crimea, it doesn't recognize all of the new annexations, and it never recognized Abkhazia and South Ossetia that Russia chopped off uh, and declared as independent states. Um, so I think that China rhetorically distances from the behavior that uh, it doesn't really like. Uh, and then the final question was on. Uh... Well, there was Taiwan, but uh, we wanted we can leave that also to uh, to Sarah. But if you want exactly, to say, yeah, uh, just, just just telegraphic. I think that China is a system that learns uh, that loves learning lessons, and they will continue to do so. Uh, Taiwan will be a very different um, operation for various reasons. So I think that the lessons that China carries home now is. Never underestimate the Western ability to come united. Don't believe that it's a paper tiger. Really work on your supply chain and on your dependency on technology, and that's what China does. Uh, never believe that your financial system and your reserves are secure if you are about to launch an invasion. So work on this. Wonderful. Sarah, you can take that one perhaps on Taiwan and enlarge a bit. But there's um, a connected question, which is um, which is about Europe's positioning vis-a-vis -vis China and Russia, and you know whether we are balancing um, the two or not, or what what should be our strategy really also around uh, around that con possible conflict. Please. Yeah, yeah. Taiwan is the obvious question indeed that we haven't touched upon. Um, 
I believe that um, this war in Ukraine was from the Chinese point of view, highly instructive because they, I think, obviously see a connection to possible uh, military attempts to retake Taiwan. So there have been military strategists in China since 2014 arguing that the hybrid takeover of Crimea was a, a, an example for, for China to emulate, actually. So there was Zhang Wenmu, for instance, from the Beihang University, who wrote something like that, but many others drew the same parallels. So what Beijing is likely learning now is a lot of tactical, um, inf interesting tactical lessons. So they they totally underestimated, for instance, the Ukrainian ability to fight back. I think even more than the, the, the unity of the West, which is probably not... Uh, indeed not uh, was not expected what's even more surprising is the ability of Ukraine itself to fight back and uh, given the right sort of assistance to actually hold this massive army at bay so uh, Taiwan is of course a very different uh, case it is an island but it is, uh, is is less well prepared than Ukraine was so there's many factors are actually different and resupplying Ukraine, uh, Taiwan in a crisis situation would be extremely difficult due to the fact that it could be blockaded. So there's a lot of differences there, but nonetheless, there are some, some lessons. And I think uh, China is studying right now these tactical you know, ingenuities that the Ukrainians have come up, how to fight uh, the Russian military, they are indeed studying the sanctions and the impact uh, the sanctions have and analyzing their own system, how to fortify China's economy against the impact of such sanctions. They are also probably trying to identify the weaknesses in their own military doctrine because the Chinese military has a lot of similarities in terms of how it is set up to the old Soviet model. So the political commissar system, for instance, is still in place in China. There's not a lot of combat experience, almost none in China. So what they're probably doing is they're trying to look at the failures of the Russian military right now and try to address corruption in the military and, and, and doctrinal shortcomings. However, they would need to completely dismantle their military system to actually address the root causes of some of these problems, which they cannot really do. So that's different, difficult uh, problem to solve. But for one of the most important lessons, I think that China is, is drawing is the effect of nuclear blackmail that Russia has been practicing to keep the Western countries from intervening in the war in Ukraine. And this is, this is one thing where we Europeans to, to, to draw the you know, bridge to the, to the other question, where we Europeans really need to look in the mirror and ask ourselves, how have we enabled this nuclear blackmail to be so effective by basically practicing self-deterrence, which is what we've been doing. We've been signaling, in particular Germany has been signaling incessantly how very, very scared we are of these uh, nuclear threats from Russia. And this is not good because it has actually had an, a big effect on Russia, but it has also probably a big effect on China in terms of trying to use this lever and, and keeping outside help at bay. So this is one of, of the things Europeans need to look into, uh, maybe not allowing uh, an authoritarian power to use nuclear weapons in such a way would be a good idea. And looking into, into our own abilities of deterrence a bit more, and also uh, maybe stopping these attempts to um, let others drive wedges between the Western alliance because our unity has has been stronger than expected, but it but it could be far more effective it, if it were even stronger. Wonderful. I think that brings us to an end. Thank you so much for um, the active questions that we got from all of the participants. And thank you so much to you, Sarah Kirchberger and Alexander Gabuev, and of course also Betty Sue for your great, great interventions. And really, I learned a lot. And I think all of, all of us really learned a lot. Thank you so much. And until next time, bye-bye.